Okay, so uh, let's start. So uh, my name is Slava Tikhanov and I'm from Royal Netherlands Academy of Arts and Sciences. And today I'm going to tell you something about uh, open science projects and about uh, how to actually to build common data infrastructures and how it can help to create COVID-19 museum. So a little bit uh, about myself. So I, I participated in more than 10 uh, European and uh, uh, national uh, data infrastructure projects uh, during the last five years. And I'm also Time Machine Europe superv supervisor in my organization. Also, I'm quite active in research uh, data alliance and uh, I also had some projects with them. And basically, um, my specific uh, specialization is uh, uh, data infrastructure, research data infrastructure. Okay, let's switch to uh, next slide. So obviously, we are moving towards open science, and it means that uh, we need large digital um, infrastructures, we need publication systems, and we need our alt metrics. Everything should be open, and it will allow us uh, to speed up open innovation and open all research to the world. And obviously, uh, it's not possible to do without um, citizen science. And citizen science is the social uh, inclusion of other people that can also contribute to research and uh, they can bring uh, their own uh, feedback. And this is how we can actually see if um, researchers do um, re relevant research. So obviously we are talking about uh, researchers working in a new situation, uh, having some feedback from people that consuming their research and from probably from companies that also interested in research and it should be moving as a one uh, single piece as open science and all data should be uh, shared and should, should be reusable and should, should be following common principles and of course it should be responsible research which means that every uh, result of every research should, should be transparent and it, it should be easily easily reproduced and also we need public engagement because it's difficult to build a large-scale projects without having people on board and uh, without having um, social uh, interaction and uh, social feedback. So uh, talking about collaboration in Europe, uh, I immediately go to Time Machine Project. So it's the uh, biggest um, international collaboration now in Europe. And uh, it's uh, basically, it has a vision to bring 5,000 years of European history to life. And it's about the digitalization of millions of historical do documents, paintings and monuments. And the idea that um, they want to create largest computer simulation ever developed, which means that after some time, probably after 10 years, you should be able to uh, use virtual reality and go back in time. So basically the idea to collect all information, to collect all historical documents and give uh, this information, this data to computer and to uh, create a model of virtual reality. And you should be able to travel back in time for 500 years, for 5,000 years, and you should be able to see all these uh, historical uh, facts that are described in, in uh, documents. So basically, it's a very large consortium with more than 600 uh, members from uh, all European countries and also uh, top academic and research institutions participating in this initiative. And there are also private companies that are very interested in this development and uh, um, there are also gaming companies uh, like, like uh, want to participate and also want to, to help to create world simulation. So basically the focus of time machine is on big data, artificial intelligence and uh, augmented uh, reality and 3D. And it just emerging because more people are coming, uh, more institutions are joining and this is how it goes now. And if you're interested, you can just visit the time machine website and I will continue. Hello. When did when did the project start? Okay, so uh, project has quite a long history as well. So first, it was Venice Time Machine, and uh, it was created um, by uh, EPFL from Lausanne, and uh, um, it was quite a successful project. And what they did, they actually uh, digitized documents and they uh, created map visualizations. So it was possible to just to go back in time for um, Venice and to see how it was looking. A uh, lot of centuries ago, 
And after they thought that probably it's a good idea just to invite other people to participate in this and share their developments. And uh, this is how it basically started as consortium. So I would say from 2015, more or less, uh, this is the date. So now uh, there are a lot of uh, different time machines already uh, quite well developed. So you can see uh, Amsterdam time machine also is very active. And uh, there is time machine from Antwerp, Dresden, of course, from Paris and Ghent and other time machines. And basically the idea of this consortium just to share all developments and all innovations between all partners. So basically it means that if Amsterdam time machine will create some nice uh, solution to plot map, um, historical map, so it can share uh, the same solution, the same tool with other time machines and they can reuse and they don't need to spend any time on development. So basically it's uh, like perfect co co collaboration, something that was created in one place goes to community and other people can reuse and they can also provide feedback and um, initial developers can, can also uh, use those uh, requirements uh, to develop new fun functionalities and features. So now I'm coming to the uh, really uh, tough topic. So it's about data management in uh, time machines, because obviously every time machine is building uh, own technology and uh, it's difficult to imagine that they're compatible and something that uh, created in, in Paris can work together with uh, tools that created in Amsterdam or in, in other cities. So basically in time machine, we're uh, talking uh, about different uh, levels of uh, data management. So there is pri primary data objects like photographs, like, like uh, images, like videos that uh, should be preserved in, in digital archives. These persistent identifiers, it's called uh, usually called trusted digital repository. And in the same time, there is secondary data that should be stored in search infrastructure with keeping data versioning and provenance information. And this is really important to understand this difference because if you have something archived, it's, a, it's a just uh, initial object, it's primary data, but uh, this object already has uh, some metadata description and some provenance information. And you really need uh, another repository. You need to put the same uh, data in another repository and create derivative because uh, researchers will add another layers of uh, information uh, uh, and metadata and uh, another layers of uh, provenance, probably something that will, they'll find uh, during the uh, project. So all this information should be curated and it should go through um, all members and uh, we, we need to see who is doing what who, uh, and how they see um, object history. It's very important. So basically after it will go to a secondary uh, source, so secondary uh, um, means that it will be a research data infrastructure. It should be available uh, in, as linked open data cl uh, cloud and uh, it will provide layer of interoperability. So basically in this case, it, if it's the same technology, uh, it doesn't matter if it's uh, in Amsterdam or it's in Paris or in, in, in Antwerp, still there is inter interoperability, the same technology and uh, all data can be shared with different research groups, with different research projects and they can basically find something new and they can also get some, some new insights, probably to find some, some interesting information for their own research. And this is how it's shared between different partners. So obviously the reuse of uh, research data should follow so-called FAIR principles and all research data should be findable, accessible, interoperable and reusable. So I really want uh, so to- I yes? on, the, on the previous slide, just for the students, could you give some uh, example of what you have in mind when you say primary data, secondary data, and uh, the other one, the link open data? Yeah. Just for, you, you have to understand that the students here are not uh, coming necessarily from uh, computer science or informatics. Mm -hmm. they, they are really broad uh, origins. And it would be good for you to give just example. What, what is for you one primary data and mm -hmm. what would be a secondary data? Okay, so um, uh, let's say uh, you have some artifact uh, and it preserved uh, at Louvre, right? And at Louvre Museum. And after it was digitized, 
and it was placed in trusted digital repository. So basically, we can only read uh, information about this artifact, about provenance, uh, some metadata, and it's shared with outside world. So uh, to make research project uh, going uh, with uh, artifact, with such an artifact, you need to put it in, in another repository, in uh, basically in, in common data uh, infrastructure. And this is where you can give access uh, to all researchers, to all people, probably if you think, think about citizen scientists, probably also to people from outside. And they can also uh, make some descriptions, they can uh, make a notation, and they can bring another level of knowledge. Okay. So obviously we are talking about secondary data because it's not coming from Louvre. Now it's coming from uh, research projects and from citizen scientists. And this information, uh, because uh, probably you will create uh, descriptions in French, so this information should be also uh, linked to uh, external control vocabularies that will allow to find this uh, if you're searching this in, in, in other languages, like in English, right? So this information will be available in linked open data cloud and people will get uh, like common, uh, common un uh, user interface and uh, they'll use semantic search to find uh, all these uh, new levels of um, information. Is it clear enough? Yeah, sure. Okay, so I will continue then. So what is FAIR? FAIR, I already mentioned it's findable. So findable means that uh, all metadata is signed uh, globally unique and persistent identifier and data described with rich metadata and metadata clearly uh, include identifier of data it describes and metadata registered or indexed in uh, searchable resource. And another point is accessible and accessible uh, metadata are retrievable by the identifier using a standardized communications protocol and protocol is open free and universal and protocols allow identification of authorization where it's necessary. And metadata are accessible uh, even if um, data is not longer available. And another principle is very important, it's interoperability. So if metadata use uh, a formal accessible shared or broadly applicable um, language for knowledge representation, so metadata should use uh, vocabularies that follow fair follow, uh, principles and they should include qualified references to other metadata. So basically, if you're talking about uh, language uh, metadata descriptions in French, this is where problem goes. So um, to, to make it interoperable, we need to add layer where people can use uh, external control vocabularies and uh, common ontologies and link the metadata to um, those ontologies to get um, a common representation in the knowledge graph. And another principle is uh, reusable. Uh, so metadata are highly described with plurality of accurate and relevant attributes and metadata released with clear and accessible data usage license, license because sometimes, uh, you know, uh, it's not open, sometimes it should be closed. Uh, in, in, in some cases, it's even about ethics that some data is not allowed to share. Uh, for example, you can think about Holocaust projects so uh, metadata also uh, should be associated with detailed provenance. So you should be you should know from where you got this uh, object, and also also metadata should be should meet a domain relevant community standards. And our organization is one of leaders in fair development, and uh, there is a project called Fair Fair, where we have different uh, fair communities collaborating together. I hope it's uh, more or less clear now. It's uh, just one question about A2. Yes. The data are accessible even when the data itself has disappeared. Yes. You, that, uh, you don't ensure the existence of the data itself along the project? Yeah, so, um, yeah, I can, I can give you a few examples. Uh, for example, uh, there are some wars, like, like war in, in Syria. And uh, I know in Time Machine, they uh, digitized uh, some uh, cultural monuments, but unfortunately, they got destroyed. So basically, data, uh, well, is the object is not uh, there, and data is not available, probably, because you don't have complete data set. 
but still metadata about this object uh, preserved in data repository. Okay, so when you speak about metadata, is the numerical metadata from an object? Yeah. From real object? Yeah, from real object. Okay, yeah. okay, okay. So uh, basically, uh, I just covered a topic about uh, data, uh, uh, about data infrastructure, and now I will go to data sharing. And uh, so obviously, we, we need to, uh, to build collaboration between different teams, between different countries even, and uh, how to uh, use uh, best practice for that. So basically, we are using uh, Harvard, so-called Harvard Data Commons, and um, it includes not only data repository that I just described, but also set of research tools connected to this data repository, also computing resources and uh, storage layer. So basically you can see also a research workflow here about collection, cleaning process and analysis, exploration and visualization of data. And after it should be curated. So basically it means that every time when you will deposit something, it should create a global persistent identifier uh, and uh, metadata uh, layer should be uh, very rich and you should use uh, data uh, uh, dictionaries and vocabularies and also you should put provenance information from where you got the information and also you should keep all versions because uh, in the search project it, it's really important to see um, all this evolution of uh, object. Also uh, it should be supporting access controls because obviously for some uh, projects you you don't want to, to give access to people outside of your team so we are also uh, supporting that so um, FN, uh, together it's just just basically working as ecosystem where a researcher can do research and he can share um, data and metadata with um, other researchers uh, probably even outside of own group and uh, it's available worldwide so everybody can collaborate So I'm switching to uh, another uh, point. So it's uh, on this slide, uh, it's, it's another project. It's called Coronavai, and I will explain what, what Coronavai is in the next slides. But actually, um, if, you'll if you'll follow uh, these um, data comments, we can create horizontal platform. And this horizontal platform is uh, our heart, how to say. This is where we can keep all data, we can keep all metadata, and we can just create different teams uh related to do, doing something uh, according to their own tasks and they just they can just go in parallel so basically it doesn't matter how much team uh, how much how many teams we have we can just scale it up because they can uh, work completely independently different uh, people from even different countries can join and they can just work on the common uh, thing without touching um other works other people works So um, at this point, um, I will switch to Dataverse. And uh, what is Dataverse? Dataverse is a platform that we're using a lot in, in uh, our projects. And basically, it's uh, exactly this horizontal uh, platform. And it's open source data repository that was developed uh, by Harvard University. And uh, it has uh, quite long history. It started in 2006. And uh, they have really good approach and a very flexible, agile development team. Basically, they're uh, welcoming all uh, contributions from uh, other people from community. And this community is already quite big. So um, currently, uh, a lot of people just considering uh, Dataverse and a lot of people already joined this community to work together on the same data platform. So basically, um, our organization now is leading a task in uh, uh, EOSC in, in the European Open Science Cloud, and we are building this platform for uh, different communities. So uh, including uh, CESDA, which is um, a consortium of data archives, and Clarin is linguistic community, and Daria is uh, digital humanities. So there are a lot of installations already, and probably this information is already outdated, but uh, currently there are 63 uh, installations worldwide. And I know it's a kind of emerging in France as well now, because uh, um, recently it was discussion about national open science plan in France. And uh, as far as I know, it was decided to use uh, Dataverse as uh, primarily um, a solution for um, data repositories. Okay. And 
And basically, uh, it's emerging in the world. And we are also working on a maturity level um, of Dataverse to make it really easy to install and maintain. You had some question? Yes. OK. Quite clear, yet. <laughs> <laughs> OK. So what are benefits of uh, having common data infrastructure for uh, different institutions and even for different countries and even for different continents? So because it's distributed and, and sustainable, it's really suitable for the future. So if you'll invest in, in this now, it will not die quickly because it's maintained in a lot of places and a lot of people already spending resources on, on making it, it live. So basically it means that uh, as more people will join, maintenance costs will drop massively and uh, you can just dedicate uh, some free money, so some free budgets to, to do training and uh, to do further development or even uh, new research. So um, it means that reuse of same infrastructure components will enforce quality and speed of knowledge exchange between different organizations and again between different countries. And it will allow to build multidisciplinary and multicultural teams that are using the same uh, infrastructure. And of course, it can bring completely new insights because you can get much more views from different angles uh, in this kind of um, infrastructure projects. So basically, you can think about common data infrastructure as a kind of gravitational layer. Uh, this is where all data science project, projects uh, will be working, and this is where they will collaborate together. Question, uh, Slavon. Yeah. Do you have some branch of uh, of uh, some some branch in the development of uh, of this tool, or it, how do you decide the evolution of the tool? Yeah. So I have uh, in in I think in like like um, okay. next okay. slide. Next fine. slide. Fine. I have. Fine. Fine. Okay. <laughs> I have this uh, in my presentation. So basically, uh, following these principles, uh, we created uh, Dataverse NL as a collaborative data network. And this is just Dutch network of universities. And currently, we have 15 uh, uni uh, Dutch universities and uh, research institutions in one uh, Dataverse instance. And every institution uh, has own uh, container and also uh, own uh, administrator. So it means that we are supporting uh, just uh, maintain and maintaining a technical solution, but they're responsible for their own data and they're also uh, responsible for curation. So basically they can decide if something should be changed or some data set should be closed or even removed. So now I'm really coming to <laughs> your question. So uh, after Dataverse NL became quite successful platform and people started to use it, we decided to uh, basically to use the same approach and create uh, own Dataverse for every uh, discipline. And currently uh, we are migrating our um, data from um, our archive uh, to uh, different Dataverses. And here you can see in the picture, for example, we have a Dataverse for archeology, span Dataverse for uh, social sciences and for humanities. And there are also other plans to, um, to create other data repositories for linguistics, for example, and um, so on. So basically how we can uh, renovate services. So uh, every uh, discipline uh, has projects and uh, we are involved in those projects. And basically we're collecting requirements from communities and we are trying to implement those requ requirements. And uh, basically uh, all our uh, implementations go back to Harvard. So Harvard, uh, it's it just uh, basically merging this functionality, this new functionality from us to their own solution. And after it's available for all people uh, on a global scale. So people can start to use uh, our development, uh, for example, in Australia, in Canada, in, in South Africa, so it doesn't matter. So it's becoming um, available for um, open science. So here you can see we have uh, Odyssey project, which is open data infrastructure for social science and economic innovation. And uh, we do a lot of um, development on the statistics and the studies and uh, this kind of analysis. And we also have Claria, which is common lab uh, research infrastructure for arts and humanities. And uh, we are adding support of linguistic, uh, linguistic data here. 
also we are working uh, in European project called Shock and so Shock means uh, social scientists and humanities open cloud. Mm -hmm. So in this project we are uh, developing tools uh, for different research communities. I already mentioned uh, data archives and linguistic communities, and also we are making de uh, cloud development. So we are trying to to run uh, uh, dataverse on the cloud, um, and also we have EOS synergy, which is basically about maturity of uh, our developments. So basically, we want to get all, all developments uh, automatically built with uh, so-called continuous integration deployment pipelines, and everything should be automatically tested. It means that people can just use out-of-the-box solutions, uh, basically installed in their place without taking ca uh, care about maintenance. So is it answering your question, how we are able to renovate our services Yes, you had never some issue with respect to compatibility of, de of new development? Uh, of course, it's an it's issue, but every time when we develop something new, uh, we are basically inviting uh, people from um, all people from Dataverse community and also other people from other communities are joining discussion and we're discussing all issues and we're making proposal. Okay. And at some point, we are making agreement that uh, at this point of time, uh, it's uh, ready enough and it's compatible and it could be this functionality, new functionality could be merged to okay. the... Um, so you are project. you are really working like an open source project? Or... It's it just open source. It's, uh, it's even more interesting because sometimes we are in collaboration with other partners uh, developing some interesting functionality for us. So uh -huh. we are also adding uh, something, some, some new features for them. And after they're basically maintaining. Okay. okay. Yeah, so basically you can think about Dataverse as a, our uh, primary platform for open innovation. And what we want, we want uh, to move from closed innovation to open innovation. And you can see this nice table, these comparisons, uh, uh, what actually it means. If you think about close innovation, you uh, and obviously uh, commercial companies, they're not able to hire all smart people and only some smart people can work for them. But in, in open innovation, it's completely different because smart people working for other partners, for other companies, for other, other organizations can join uh, open science projects and we can do development together. We can bring, uh, bring new requirements and we, we can basically um, innovate quickly and uh, in, in closed innovation also profit from R&D it's more like distributed inside of the company and uh, in uh, open innovation if you think about research and development that can can create some significant value it's distributed with all partners and it's shared and they can also participate and add even new value so also uh, regarding um, Companies, so companies that uh, will get innovation first, uh, they, they can win, win market. But in our business model, uh, well, not business, but our model is completely different because it's basically uh, we, we just just introducing some uh, working solutions, and this is how it goes to to the market, and even more people are joining the development. So. Obviously, uh, we can make best use of internal and external ideas, and we will win against of even big corporations in this case, because all the world is working with us. And of course, uh, we partner with uh, universities a lot, so we are creating new knowledge, and uh, we are also encouraging use of this knowledge outside of this field. And we are going uh, abroad, and uh, we are talking to people from different continents and they're basically joining uh, our developments. So um, now I'm coming back to fair principles and um, uh, I just want to mention that uh, Dataverse uh, is very, um, very seriously considering also fair principles. They want to be compliant. Uh, and uh, however, they themselves are saying that uh, fair is not really about compliance, but it's about process to um, innovate uh, on services. So anyway, so uh, Harvard team uh, did evaluation of uh, an assessment of own fairness, and uh, they discovered that 
discovered that it has really strong support for findable, accessible, and reusable principles. However, there is um, really weak support for in interoperability because all control vocabularies stored internally in the system. So basically, there is no possibility to connect external control vocabularies and use uh, ontologies like Wikidata or other. And that's something that we are going to change in our developments. So uh, talking about interoperability issues in the European Open Science Cloud, uh, you can think about four different issues. So first, it's about technical interoperability. It's, it means ability of different information systems basically to communicate and exchange data and semantic interoperability. I already mentioned uh, all these issues with language and uh, uh, it's about the ability of computer system to transmit data with an ambiguous and shared meaning. And basically here we are talking about knowledge graph and knowledge discovery and uh, this kind of stuff. Uh, also, there is organizational interoperability. It's basically about policies, how to do things, and uh, legal interoperability because there is also GDPR law. And uh, of course, uh, we should be compliant and uh, it's not allowed to share some data sets that, uh, for example, have um, family names. So we should, should be also uh, seriously. I mean, but actually, you are uh, sharing data with the rules of the strongest community. I mean, the, if, if one country accepts to share some kind of data and another country don't accept to share this type of data, Mm -hmm. How does it go? So, mm -hmm. I understand this issue, and uh, of course, uh, we already face it. Uh, these kind of problems, uh, like in Germany, there is slightly different GDPR law than in Netherlands. So uh, basically, uh, it's uh, up to um, to the organization that uh, maintaining and running a data repository to decide uh, about policy. Uh, it's mean that. You cannot have uh, different policies attached to one type of data depending uh, of the country where it is looked. No, no, no. It's policy should be really uh, <laughs> defined and unique. Yeah. Okay. Because for a blockchain, you could imagine that uh, you have uh, uh, two policies attached one object yeah but, but it, it it could be contradictory also so okay okay it's okay. yeah it's it's like like for gdpr cases it's really dangerous you know. oh. <laughs> okay so i will move on and uh, i will tell you about interoperability on a global scale and that's something we are trying to uh, do right now so we are building fair metadata schemas for European research communities. I already mentioned consortium of European social science data archives. So basically we have the whole Europe in this uh, um, consortium and uh, they're going to um, run a data versus data repository in, in near future. Also, we are working with Clarion community, which is linguistics uh, about uh, implementation of component metadata infrastructure. And of course, our idea just to connect metadata and ontologies and uh, use external control vocabularies that will allow uh, to link everything together. So uh, there is also uh, SCOS involved. SCOS is simple knowledge organization. And this is uh, ontology that allows to define the relationship between different uh, metadata fields, between different entities. So basically, we want also to provide multilingual access to control vocabularies. And all contributions that we do, I already mentioned a few times, everything should go to Dataverse community and should be merged in source code. So basically, it means that all countries should get updates and they should start to use this functionality to be compliant <coughs> with uh, all interoperability issues. So um, yeah, it's difficult to, uh, <laughs> to, yeah. to underestimate the importance of standards and ontologies. So something that happened in, in the United States, like, like now there is COVID-19 topic and uh, there is uh, US National Library of Medicine who is maintaining uh, medical subjects headings and basically the whole world is using this, this standard uh, in, in uh, COVID-19 uh, research. 
but also uh, very important to, to have Wikidata uh, open ontology supported and uh, other standards. So that's something that uh, we are working right uh, we're we working on right now and uh, hopefully uh, after our functionality uh, for uh, external control vocabulary support will be merged. It's probably happened in one month or two. So everybody will get the same ground and this is how we can build um, uh, we can start to build a common knowledge graph and it means that all um, information can be linked together and uh, all data can can be, consumed in all research projects worldwide. So yeah? It's mean, it's mean that you have created a meta ontology which link the all previous ontology to, together. Then I can imagine that there are some issue from some technical issue because the you can have the same object described by two different words, but you can also have one word describing two different objects. Yes. Yeah, I, I basically have it in, in my next slides. Okay, sorry. <laughs> no problem. Sorry, sorry. No problem. I will explain how it works. So basically, uh, we started to use a so-called Cosmos framework, and this is really nice framework for uh, a knowledge organization and uh, different ontologies can be placed here and you can get kind of index uh, where you, you can scroll and you, you can go through different concepts. So basically it's very convenient web interface, but also it has API that allows us to connect uh, uh, external applications like Dataverse. And it could be used for different use cases like publish vocabularies, build discovery systems uh, and uh, to do vocabulary visualization and the most interesting thing now is really emerging in France because I know at least 10 installations of uh, this framework. And uh, for example, INRA is using this and uh, they're waiting for our pull request to be merged to, to get it used with uh, Dataverse. So basically in France, it's already a really good situation and uh, this is where things basically already started. So uh, now I, I will just show how it works in uh, this web interface, it's deposit form of Dataverse. So basically what we implemented, it's really simple uh, con external control vocabulary support. Uh, you can get a, a field. Uh, so in this case, it's keyword and you can select vocabulary like first is UNESCO. And uh, if you'll type for some term, you will see a list of suggested terms. And after you will select something, uh, it will be uh, automatically filled in, in, uh, in vocabulary URL or in term URL. So basically this is a way how you can connect uh, the same uh, entity to different control vocabularies if you would like to. And the most important thing after we showed uh, this functionality to uh, our French partners, I believe INRAE, they said that they want also to use um, language switch, basically to be able to switch uh, to French during uh, metadata deposit process. And we implemented a uh, functionality that allows to define language uh, by default. And also if language switch is enabled, they can uh, switch to French uh, uh, during the process. And after they'll type in term field, they'll search for some concepts, they'll get only uh, concepts in French. But uh, despite of that, it will be linked to the same uh, term URL, which means that uh, if you'll use another language, it basically doesn't matter as soon as you have the same URL as a final pointer where you, you can link uh, all information. Is it clear enough? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so it means uh, that- uh, just, just one soon. That's, okay. This is going from one Theosaurus to another Theosaurus. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. The question is, let, it means that when you are looking for an object, when you are looking for, okay, when you are looking using some metadata, you need to specialize with which theosaurus you are looking for this object. Yeah, that's it's correct. But in some sense, you need to be a specialized. Yeah. And when you have start your talk, your presentation, you said it has to be open for non-specialized. And if you start to 
make it open to non-specialized, they will not know which theosaurus they are using. They will start to use natural language. Mm -hmm. In natural language, how does it work? It means yes. mm -hmm. I understand. natural language, let's take this example with family. Mm -hmm. Family can be existing in several theosaurus mm -hmm. such that it will give different objects. And the question is, uh, how does it work? Yeah, so basically uh, what we did, we, we developed this uh, functionality and we created um, also some documentation for administrators so they can allow uh, uh, people to use specific uh, ontologies to describe their metadata. So everything is in control of uh, um, data repository uh, maintainer. Okay. Okay, so this is for people who are making metadata. This mm -hmm. is not search. Yeah, so people are limited by uh, basically a repository uh, maintainer. Okay. Repository okay. owner. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. So um, now I'm coming to use case, and uh, this is quite a relevant use case for us because it's about COVID-19 expert questions, but also you can think about any research question that uh, can be placed here. So in this example, uh, there is a, just a database of research questions that was uh, put in, in SCOS model, and uh, it's available uh, in SCOSMOS, so you can browse through different research questions and you can see um some some information about them but in in uh, dataverse web interface you can now type some questions uh by keywords and you can get list of uh, uh research questions here and you can basically select some question that uh, you think corresponding to uh, your data and basically it means that you can put and you can link any research question to your data set and update it will be available in linked open data cloud so basically any researcher can find this information in the easy way. And uh, of course, um, it means that um, uh, this linked open data cloud will be dynamic. So probably if you'll query tomorrow, you, you can get even more data sets uh, linked to your research question. So basically we, we do understand uh, the complication here that uh, if a um, uh, list of research questions only in uh, Let's say in English, it's not really useful. So this is why they are working on uh, also on uh, localization uh, framework actually to provide possibility to translate those questions, uh, for example, in French. So basically uh, the same uh, term URL, but but you can get the same question translated in all, all languages. And this is how you can do your research. And this is how you can annotate uh, some papers that are interesting for you, but they're written in another language. And even more interesting that uh, after we, we started to do that, we are able to get uh, those research questions uh, as a source for um, machine learning models. So basically we can create a artificial intelligence pipeline that can classify data sets according to uh, uh, what it knows from what, what researcher already entered and what kind of links uh, we have created. Is it clear enough uh, that you can classify and link uh, research questions to data? Yes, 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 yes. Okay, I will move on. So we created service, it's called WebLate, and this is exactly what I'm talking about. Uh, in, in this service, uh, it's also a um, kind of crowdsourcing tool. Yeah? Yeah. yeah. It's a kind of crowdsourcing tool uh, where you can also uh, synchronize all translations together. So if you have only English, uh, so you can add French translation or German translation and doesn't matter. So you, you can just basically get different uh, reflections of the same uh, entity and everything should be saved in system and after it can go back to our services. So this is a way how we can maintain uh, consistency and we can make uh, uh, this knowledge graph that we are building sustainable because you can type question in any language and still you can get uh, the same uh, papers linked to this question or the same data sets. Yeah. Yeah, yes. 
So um, after, of course, WebLate is not only one thing that uh, we are building. So we are also working on Dataverse App Store, obviously, because we have uh, quite well developed uh, and defined uh, data infrastructure. So we have a lot of applications that uh, we can already connect uh, to this infrastructure. And I'm talking about data previewers. So for example, we have DDI Explorer, which is a tool that allows to uh, browse to DDI uh, uh, studies, uh, studies coded in DDI, and also we have a spreadsheet viewer, we have PDF, text file, HTML images, video, audio, and uh, geospatial um, tools connected to Dataverse. And I already mentioned we are working on external control vocabulary support, which means uh, SCOS is also part of, uh, Cosmos is also part of uh, Dataverse Apple Store, App Store. And also we are working on migration pipelines. And it's quite interesting topic because a lot of uh, institutions worldwide and in France as well, they're running um, old systems and now they want to migrate their data to something like Dataverse and they don't know how because it's quite expensive. So they, ha they, ha they have to find uh, uh, experts and uh, they have to do mappings. And this is where we are helping basically. to We are creating a um, universal tool that can do this automatically. And I already mentioned uh, a lot linked open data cloud. So we, we also have a Spark endpoint and uh, so-called uh, fair data point. This is in development of one of our project. And um, also we are, we are supporting federated identification. So it means that you can use your account that uh, coming from your institution, you can use uh, for all parts of the infrastructure and also for Dataverse. Also, we, we are busy with natural language tools integrations, and I will show you how, and visualization tools. So first, I want to show you uh, how spreadsheet, spreadsheet previewer looks like. So if you'll deposit some uh, CSV or Excel file in Dataverse, uh, it will give you possibility just to see, like, like on Google spreadsheet, you can just see the content of this file without download which is very convenient. And after we uh, contributed this functionality to Harvard, it's available uh, worldwide for all partners and people really happy with it because it's kind of visual, it gives visual entrance to data. They don't have to download everything, they can just scroll through different data set to see where they can find some relevant uh, data for their research. Mm -hmm. Another tool, and uh, it's called uh, Clarin Switchboard, and it's about na na natural language processing. For example, if you have some uh, document, you can deposit in Dataverse, and after you can just run a set of tools, and you can do a lot of interesting things like to do name entity recognition or morphological analysis or uh, lemmatization or morphosyntactic tagger and this kind of stuff. So basically, you can. Uh, uh, run uh, natural language processing tools, and you can get this information also stored back in Dataverse. However, it's not finished yet, and uh, now we are working on this process. So now I'm coming to really interesting point uh, where we we uh, standing now. So we have a very well developed um, data infrastructure and it's deployed in uh, and uh, maintained in a lot of countries and we have a lot of data coming to this infrastructure and uh, it's available in network. But uh, how actually to standardize everything uh, by hands? It's not feasible and it's not possible because already mentioned you, we don't have any external control vocabulary support. So basically, uh, we, we are trying to uh, uh, find solution with using artificial intelligence and machine learning. So it means that uh, we are basically uh, asking experts to create uh, some initial links and uh, we can use those links to train uh, machine, learning, uh, machine learning models and we can ask a computer to do this uh, automatically. So there is a coronavirus community who does that and uh, they also have quite interesting models already developed and uh, they're really working on, on natural language processing pipelines that can do that automatically. And there are a lot of people already participating. But of course, uh, it's only part of story. We need uh, proper semantic web support because obviously uh, if you'll do name entity recognition, you will get a lot of uh, names, uh, locations, and whatever. But but it means nothing be, uh, without links to 
let's say geo names or Wikidata or Wikipedia even. So, because there is disambiguation, and if you will see some uh, some entity like Paris, you don't know if it's a city or it's a family name or it's something else, you know. So uh, it means that historically most of data sets preserved in data silos, uh, archives, and not interlinked, and uh, they're lacking of standardization. And basically, what we are trying to do, we're integrating linked data and semantic web technologies with artificial artificial intelligence, and uh, we are forcing research communities to share data uh, and add more interoperability, following fair principles. And uh, you already know we are we are going to add external control vocabulary support which means that we can use what they are producing to train uh, machine learning models. And we can use this information, this data in the large scale projects like Time Machine, Coronavirus and uh, COVID-19 and uh, doesn't matter in which project. It's just a model that uh, trained and it can help to do some prediction about uh, automatic linkage of uh, some, some entities to some control vocabularies. So why it's important? Uh, well, I already mentioned uh, like, like for COVID-19, there are not so many experts <laughs> available. And if you'll think about the current situation, there are a lot of papers that uh, not getting proper uh, peer review, but getting published. Uh, and uh, there is no possibility for human actually to review it properly. And uh, we don't know what is written uh, in those papers. And this is why basically researchers do the same thing a lot of times without knowing that it was already done and the result was, was negative or positive. So basically what we want, uh, we want to use artificial intelligence and I already mentioned how. So we are going to build uh, automatic pipelines with some uh, human interaction and we, we, we will apply these um, pipelines to name entity recognition, data mining, topic classification and other things. And basically we should be able to build multidisciplinary knowledge graphs that uh, will facilitate development of new project with, uh, well, let's say, economic and social scientists, but doesn't matter to which which scientists. And after we'll see value in in this work, of course, when they want they want to take ownership of uh, data that artificial intelligence produced. After we'll do review and after we'll uh, accept results. So this is just example. Um, so it's uh, called Spacey. It's a modern NLP framework. And even if you put some text inside, you can get list of named entities that can, can be filled as metadata and can be stored in data repository. So this is very, very convenient. So if you have, uh, let's say, historical documents or you have some, some newspapers, you, uh, you, you can put this text in, in this pipeline, you can get those entities and after you can just create uh, descriptive metadata. And uh, here, uh, the only one thing is missing actually is linked to uh, external control vocabularies like geo names, because this is where you can resolve disambiguation. So basically, this is where we are going now with uh, coronavirus. And you, you will do this on all the text or only the abstract or? It's, it's, it can be any piece of text. It can recognize now it's quite well trained model already. And uh, you can also. I'm convinced, I, I'm convinced that it can be done on any type of text. Yeah. It's about the length and the complexity of. Uh, and the time it will take to analyze the complex text. Is yeah. it an issue or not an issue? No, it's not issue anymore if it's deployed in the cloud. So you can scale it up. Of course, it still takes time to do processing and results uh, should, be, uh, should be refined. But okay. uh, technology is good enough to be used in large scale projects, I would say. Okay. And if you need something more, for example, we are having requests from uh, scientists that working on the classification of professions. So obviously we, we want to train their own model. So they're bringing uh, initial data set uh, with all entities and we can just train model, we can put in this framework and it should work. Okay. So basically it, it looks really good already. However, uh, we need to think how to control this artificial intelligence. 
So I'll specifically put this image here just to remind that sometimes it could be dangerous also. And it's naive to fully trust machine learning and artificial intelligence. And of course, we need to support human loop processes to take control over automatic workflows. Of course, ethics is very important. I already mentioned Holocaust documents. And uh, another problem that you, Eve, already mentioned to me is effect detection because not all data can be trusted. So obviously we need human, we need experts uh, to review uh, what actually we, we processing. So basically we are working on a solution uh, called human in a loop. And there are some tools that already developed in different research projects. And uh, we just need to add, um, we, we just need to select best tools and uh, we need to add uh, continuous integration deployment pipelines to be uh, able to use those tools uh, on a global scale. And just to give you an example how it looks like, I don't know why it's not coming. Oh, well, that's weird. Oh, yeah, now. So um, there is a tool that was developed in France. It's called Semantic Bot, and basically it's ontology lookup service. So it means that if you have some data set, uh, let's say a spreadsheet, and uh, you're interested to know how to link your columns from your spreadsheet. Uh, if you have some variables to which ontologies, it can do prediction to which it can be linked. But after it just asking questions from a human, from basically from expert, if it's really corresponding to uh, what was predicted and you can say yes and no, and you, you can basically can confirm the choice. And after it will create uh, so-called uh, semantic mappings that will allow to, to convert F into uh, RDF. So it's semi-automatic uh, system. Yeah. And another tools, and uh, now I'm, I'm switching to annotation tools. Uh, so there is really nice framework uh, called Hypothesis. It was developed in the United States and basically it could be used as a peer review service on the, uh, in the crowdsourcing environment. And basically it has a really nice functionality that allows uh, to see, uh, for example, some, some uh, to, to, to select some pieces of text and to create uh, human annotations. And uh, the way how we uh, try to use this tool uh, connected to artificial intelligence, we can just highlight uh, all uh, uh, fragments with uh, named entities with some interesting facts that we found and human annotators should confirm that this is right uh, uh, result corresponding to reality. So if they'll see some fakes, for example, they can also make notation that they think that this is fake and it should be not going into a data set. So this is kind of the way to validate uh, results coming from artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. And another tool that uh, very is also very interesting, I already mentioned use case where we want to train um, our own customized uh, machine learning models related to your own research. So there is a tool that was developed in Japan and it's called the Kana. So basically you can just highlight, you can create a list of uh, entities by yourself. You can uh, also highlight uh, which um, entity should belong to which class and it could be used to train machine learning models. So next time artificial intelligence can do exactly the same process automatically. And you can get really nice uh, um, metadata in, in, your, in your data set. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and um, another thing uh, about visualization. So um, I mentioned a lot about, uh, about tools that we already have. And currently we're working uh, with a visualization framework called Apache Superset. And this is really nice framework that was originally developed by uh, Airbnb. And after some time, they decided to make it open source. So they just published um, on GitHub and uh, this um, open license. And uh, now there are a lot of other companies joined and other organizations, other universities. So basically it's collaborative effort to develop a common visualization framework. And uh, currently we're busy to connect it to Dataverse. And it means that you should be able to visualize um, your data on the map uh, in a few clicks. 
and you can also select like map visualization you can you can put information on the charts and it's very easy to download uh, from superset uh, image and put in publication so basically this is where we are going and uh, another thing that uh, i should mention you can also create um dynamic dashboard you can put visualizations you would like to be attached with your data and after people can just uh, uh, evaluate your results in a visual way, which is very nice and useful for any research. So um, I already mentioned a lot of things and basically what we are doing now uh, in at Karanoi community, we already have understanding that all this stuff is open science, is emerging and uh, it's not only Europe, it's United States, it's the whole world we have in it. So basically we started to build the integration uh, layer uh, and we called it BFAIR Open Science Framework, where all, all of those developments are available and uh, the idea that they should be, uh, we should be able to build them and synchronize with uh, all developments worldwide uh, in, in an automatic way. So we are building this as a part of infrastructure and uh, you can see there are a lot of um, components already available and uh, it's mentioned here and it's from mostly from European Union, but uh, also, uh, of course, other countries contributing. So basically, uh, there is also a basic infrastructure that I've created for COVID-19 Museum and it has Dataverse and a couple of other components. And uh, there is also Airflow framework that allows uh, actually to, to collect um, data and put in Dataverse uh, in a reliable way. And it's uh, ready to start for COVID-19 Museum after the cloud infrastructure will be available okay. for COVID-19 Museum. Okay. Okay. So, yeah, if you have questions, I'm really open now. Yeah. So, is there any question? We have uh, something about 15 participants plus uh, three person, four persons here. May I speak from my seat or do I have to move? No, you can speak. Uh, I was, the, the microphone is here. Okay, so go ahead. Hi, Slava. Hey. Thank you very much for your talk, which was as clear as possible for someone studying literature as I do. Thank you very much. Uh, when you first started talking, you said that you collaborated with private companies. Mm -hmm. uh, is Ubisoft? A yeah. part of them, or do you work with any electronical historical game company? Yeah, it's um, of course, I, I was talking about Ubisoft. So, um, in Time Machine, they already created a really nice uh, simulation, and uh, probably you know about Notre Dame de Paris uh, simulation that uh, basically available online now. And uh, I, I actually have uh, my, my own device with. Uh, there are simulations of uh, old cities from uh, Syria. So, and there are other companies also involved in this, of course, not okay. only Ubisoft. Okay, thank you very much. You're welcome. Is there any other question from uh, the students or everywhere? Come on, don't be shy. I know it was a surprising subject, but uh, okay. I have one question, Slava. Let's imagine I want to, uh, first of all, I want to understand one thing. Is there a way to ensure computation inside the project or do you have to download the data on which you would like to work to make some computation? Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, um, yeah, this is really important question. So basically, uh, Dataverse is a part of API economy. So it means that it's not uh, really necessary to download object uh, and to do processing on your computer. So you can do it uh, in virtual research environment that deployed somewhere in the cloud or on some server. And after you can get the result of processing and you can deposit it back in data repository in Dataverse. Okay. Basically, basically, everything can be done transparently and uh, you will just uh, get notification after it will be finished. Okay, so it means you have a kind of uh, 
computing results uh, which are shared somewhere using a, a kind of city at home or folding at home or no it can um, it can be any kind of service and there are a lot of services connected to uh, dataverse uh, uh, well there is research space uh, project that uh, can can uh, consume data from dataverse there are a lot of uh, other integrations and pro probably I will just put a list of integrations in the chat because uh, it's okay. quite quite a uh, long list already. And my second uh, question is about reproducible research. Mm -hmm. And uh, with reproducible research, I need to be able to build the same list of document yeah. I have. Uh, I, I have consult uh, or, or I have a. Uh, request for first time so it's mean um how do you ensure this because when you was building request it was not clear that the document was uh, the list of the documents you get was reproducible um well um reproducibility of course it's quite a tough topic so we are somewhere in the middle of the road with re reproducibility and uh, basically it's not so simple also to keep provenance for all uh, involved actors so, yes this is this is an issue uh, that i am considering which is really something uh, very hard to think about yeah so um you can think about uh, let's say so data set drift if data set is developed in time, so there are different versions of the same data set. It's like first thing. Also, software is uh, changing in time, so you, you have to uh, uh, to keep uh, the track of all uh, versions of software, because obviously uh, you can get different results in the end. Yep. So they, in the ideal case, uh, you, you can archive software in this uh, software heritage archive, uh, which is basically in France, in Paris and you can get access to versions and you can also use those versions after some time so uh often should be basically tracked and uh, should be stored as provenance information in dataverse to be able to run a reproducible research okay yes Juliet. i have another question about ontology um is there someone or is there even a group in Time Machine Europe working on the cultural and ethical meanings, connotations of the words used in the um, ontologies? For example, I read from one of the slides the word race, which has quite a different meaning in the European countries and in uh, the USA. Yeah, <laughs> of course. Um, so, uh, I know it was discussed a lot and there is no agreement how they're going to cover these kind of issues uh, because there are different views on the same events on the same topic and it should be kind of agreement between uh, scientists. So um, there are a few groups uh, active in time machine but uh, well as far as I know there is no common agreement yet. It's really, uh, it's in a way, it's also a very sensitive topic if you'll think about wars or about some uh, events and uh, people have completely different, uh, uh, could have completely different views on uh, some events. Sure. Quite true. Sure, sure. Um, I have one question. Um, um, just coming back on the topic of translations and uh, um, uh, review, uh, getting um, the same data set when I doing some research. Mm -hmm. um, let's us uh, like I'm willing to do a systematic research review, right? So I I put some rationals in the research in the first uh, to get uh, the, the 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 papers. Um, and then um, they have a variable that you talk about, which is actually very good. It's the translations mm -hmm. for some topics, because if I search it in French, I'm expecting I will probably get also from English topics, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, is it a way to nevertheless ease the re reproductivities of the, the first so that I can get the same result? I mean, 
Eve already talked about that, but is it the translation making it more complicated uh, to get the femme revert afterwards? Well, <laughs> again, reproducibility is very uh, difficult topic and uh, it's not only about translation itself. You can also think about like concept drift it's called. So something that changing meaning in uh, through time, you know, so it doesn't necessarily mean that if you have some some uh, translation that was done 10 years ago or 100 years ago, it's uh, corresponding to the meaning that uh, you think right now. So it's only it, it's only how how hum, human it's only human can, can, can make judgment about that. It's not possible to do it automatically. Jacques, ça vous satisfait comme réponse? In English. Sorry. Not really. I mean, it's it's partly uh, uh, okay. Um, you, you, it's it's really challenging when you would like to to do this kind of systematic li literature review to not get the same revert, right? Because then uh, the whole is in questions. Uh, uh, especially if you want it to be published, then you yeah. have already uh, a very huge barrier to, yeah. to 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 provide accuracy of your search. So um, yeah, it's probably something that needs to be for the uh, check right yeah it's uh, for i already mentioned uh, so we have a lot of um uh, human in the loop tools that could be useful so basically if you have experts in house you can give them uh, those tools and uh, this is how you can make uh, you can increase quality of research but there is no way to do it automatically and uh, these translations, uh, well, people can, can also, um, depending from who is translating what, it can be also different, you know? Okay, yeah. thank Jacques, you. Jacques, you have to understand that the translation is just one tool that you are using inside the process. So you have the automatic process that you will have to set up and that you will have to store. It means you store really how you process the data. And then you have the data before. So you have to store the data, or at least the list of the data you have access to. And then you have to store the process you will put on the data. Mm -hmm. And what is reasonable is also to store the result of the process. Because this is an issue, is not to be able to check whether or not you get the same result using the same tools on the same data, but 10 years after. Yeah, mm -hmm. Just in front of the image, please. Oh, sorry, I'm not in front of the image, yeah. So this, this is a real issue and uh, it's, uh, it, it's something which Slava said they are thinking about, but uh, it's not really already prepared completely, if I have well understood. No, 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 it's not, not prepared. And uh, especially now, because uh, all these artificial intelligence solutions basically emerging, it's uh, out of the control. Yeah. You don't know, it's a black box. How to yeah, draft yeah, uh, what uh, it's produced. Yeah, it's a black box. And uh, the only thing is that you should be able to say, OK, I have used this black box in version blah, 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 and uh, store all this process. And uh, Jacques, this is uh, in some sense done on this virtual machine that you stored when you have some data to analyze. You stored the virtual machine, which has processed the data. So you don't store the data inside the virtual machine. You store the state of the virtual machine, yep. which has processed the data. Yeah, and uh, currently we also have a working group uh, in uh, Dataverse uh, community. So basically, we are discussing how to uh, create, uh, how how to archive complete uh, images, how to uh, to store those images uh, and uh, create preservation layer. So people after 10 or 20 or 100 years should be able to reproduce results of uh, such projects. Yeah, Juliette? If I understood well, you told us that Time Machine Europe is going to collect all documents available mm -hmm. uh, 
about historical events in Europe. Uh, what about literature? For example, will you consider Shakespeare's Macbeth or Richard III as an historical document? Yeah, it's a good question. I think they want to do this, but still, uh, I don't know if someone already does that. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. This would be a database inside a library, for example, if I well understood. It yeah, would be, probably. Yeah. Is there other question from uh, anyone in the room? Ah oui, si quelqu'un veut poser une question en français, il n'y a aucun problème, on peut traduire. Hein. En plus, la va par le français, donc. Yeah, you can try in French. <laughs> Chinese, perhaps not, but uh, <laughs> Céline. <laughs> non, pas d'autres questions. I, I, I wanted to say that it's very, very interesting because we are in the context of a digital museum, right? So um, when you go in the normal museum, you expect to see the same piece. And it, when the time is going on, come back 10 years after you have the same piece because it has been well uh, pro, uh, um, protected. Uh, protected and so on. So, um, so it's very interesting to see that it's kind of the same process that you try to build data uh, uh, on the backstage. Um, um, I hope that it will be very successful because that is the whole idea of the COVID museum, obviously, that we get the same thing uh, when the time passed. Um, and, and then we can use it, uh, or, or other generation use it uh, the way we used uh, some time ago. So, um, yeah, we hope that you will come with an update that will be helpful, at least uh, for those that are not technicians like us uh, to work with. <laughs> yeah, but I would say uh, COVID-19 Museum is already around uh, us. So if you think about videos with empty streets, everything is already published and available on YouTube, for example. You can find a lot of photographs published somewhere in different sources. And basically, this is where uh, primary data is already preserved, right? Yeah. And the Dataverse, I already mentioned a lot of times, it's a secondary data source. This is where you can get links uh, to original objects. And those links should be, um, should have metadata descriptions and should be connected uh, and linked to ontologies and control vocabularies. And this is how you can make this information findable and linked. And uh, it should be also searchable through uh, semantic search, which means that if you'll search in, Sp in Spanish or French, you should be able to find this. Doesn't matter which kind of description it will be. Or if it's um, available in knowledge graph, you can also query uh, some uh, Sparkle endpoints, like technical solutions that could, could provide you uh, data about what is already stored there. So it's all feasible and it's basically exactly the same concept as Time Machine Europe has. Okay, thanks, thanks, thanks. So it's now here 11.21. I propose that we take a 14 minutes break and we come back at 11.35, if it's okay for everyone. So 14 minutes break. And then Anne will uh, speak about uh, the same thing in some sense, but uh, probably more the idea which are behind this. <laughs> 